How are you doing guys? Welcome back to another video. Today is going to be a very data driven and also physiology based video about training, especially for triathlon 17.3 and full Ironman. If you enjoy this kind of content. So for who is this video? It's basically for every athlete that's really passionate about the physiology. I personally have been really passionate about it. I've been studying it uh, extensively and I have a team of like people around me who are very, very good at that. So in endurance sports, there's basically only one consensus when it comes to training. That is basically there's close to no consensus of what leads to ultimate performance. I can give one example about pro cycling, a current pro cycling team, one of the best triathlon coaches in the world as well, Dan Lorang. He has five colleagues as well, and they all have world tour pro cyclists who are all within 1% of each other. And they check their training and they sat down. And those five coaches had completely different approaches, not even remotely the same. And all of those guys eventually ended up at the top. So the reason I mention this is that there are many ways to get from A to B. Something that's super important is that it's always very, very individual. So depending where the athlete and what kind of stage she is, what kind of training, physiology the body has, that is one consensus that is basically very individual to the athlete. And in order to have someone that like a coach or anybody that really looks in detail for that athlete, I think it needs a level of commitment that goes beyond most things. When you look, for example, at the moment in long distance triathlon, the best guys have the people that care the absolute most for them. We can talk about Sam Laidlow, his own dad coaches him. Then you talk about the Norwegians. They have a coach who, in my opinion, basically adopted the two athletes, Christian Gustav. So there's an extreme tight relationship. Lucy, Charles Barkley, who just won Kona, own husband plays a major role. The reason I mention this is because in order to go to this type of detail, it takes a lot, a lot of energy of time and caring to really find that potential for that athlete. So why am I just sharing my knowledge that I just gained over the last 12 years and all this stuff? Why am I sharing it to YouTube and to the world, basically to see to the internet, if I think that's something that is so outside the box, which I do think to some extent I fill some gaps. First of all, result wise, nobody will care what I say and what I do until basically it is too late that I will have those results and I will have the performance. And by that time, I believe I'll be so far ahead of many people, not all of them, but at least 95% of the people I'll be so far ahead that it doesn't matter anymore. Then a training plan is also a really small part of it. The recovery, everything you do around that, how you execute that training plan is super essential. For example, you could have Jan Frodeno's training plan tailored to you in percentage wise. I'm pretty sure you would still not perform because there's a lot that goes behind it. Small decision making, tweaking, and those are the actual details that really matter as well. All right, let's get into it. So I think as an athlete, you basically have to be a scientist to some extent. What I mean with that is, I don't mean lactate strips and what everything goes on in triathlon right now. I don't mean that per se. I mean, what you basically have to do is you have to formulate a hypothesis. So basically saying, okay, this is what I think it takes in training right now for me as an individual athlete to be good on race day and race well then. So you formulate a hypothesis in training and then you test that hypothesis like a scientist would in a lab, not in a lab. In this case, the ultimate test and the only test that's valid, doesn't matter what I think or anybody thinks or any coach thinks what works for me. The only thing that matters is the performance on race day, unless something goes wrong, but it shouldn't be the case if it's a normal day, the performance on race day is the only thing, the only measure that counts. Then when it comes to testing that hypothesis, many people wait until race day and I've fallen into the trap of that. I've had quite a few coaches, also world renowned coaches, and only two of those coaches actually did what I think is necessary and what I'm gonna implement right now in my training is that you test that hypothesis is what you do working right now actually working. So a lot of people, they just train and you see the objective results in training getting better. So if you swim, bike, run faster, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're gonna have the triathlon performance, the cocktail of the three, that that's gonna be very, very good but you can improve individually, but the cocktail isn't guaranteed. So next to the ultimate test of the race day, I think you need to have a system in place to frequently, without burning yourself out mentally, physically, all that, you need to check specifically, are you really, for the big day, improving swim back run for the measures that you're looking for. All right, let's get into my hypothesis 
for the coming year, the ones that I have right now and that I believe are the case, but they are a hypothesis, so they're not proven yet. And the only proven thing will be first the steps on the way with testing and obviously the race day itself, which will be early 2024, a 70.3 and a full Ironman. So hypothesis number one. The lactate threshold and its related paces in swim, bike, run are the main determinator of becoming world-class. That sounds kind of obvious to some, but I don't think people actually have it in their training as much. So basically that your high-end ability of swim, bike, run, what is your maximum potential and speeds that one determines your zone 2 ability in a breakdown wise and first and foremost that and after that i believe and that's hypothesis only after that high end comes the ability to the endurance ability to perform at the high percentage of that threshold in a 70.3 in ironman so how do you improve lactate threshold if i say as my hypothesis number one lactate threshold is the number one most important thing for an athlete the highest one with a swim bike run lactate threshold given he can operate the high percentage of that threshold in 70.3 ironman that one is going to win is going to be the best so how do you how do you improve lactate threshold there are only two ways physiology wise how you can do that the number one is the modify the rate of lactate clearance and number two is modify the rate of lactate production so i tackle both of that with my approach number one is lactate clearance that means high-end work, so how well your body can produce and clear the lactate basically after producing it. That is number one of lactate threshold. Number two is a, that you don't at all, let's say, produce the lactate. And for that, you need a lot of endurance and I do that with the zone two work especially. Then we come to hypothesis number two, and that is training from the top down is more efficient than training from the bottom up. What most people do, and it definitely works 100%, is that when train, training from the bottom up, I basically mean that you use a lot of threshold work, a lot of aerobic work, but a lot of threshold, especially in swim, bike, run, to kind of lift your threshold up through that. So push the aerobic ability up, 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 and get a better threshold through that, which 100% works, but that's not the one I'm gonna use. And I do believe to some extent that you have to break some rules if you want to push a bit outside the box and uh, this is one way i will do this so i will be training from the top down that means there will be a lot of high-end focus but without breaking the 80 20 rules weekly so not suddenly training 40 percent at high end if you calculate the minutes spent uh, weekly at that high end is actually not even 20 percent with me it's 15 percent so one big mistake again it comes down to caring i see coaches do because it takes a lot of time. They do not calculate actually a simple 80-20 rule, which everybody knows, people don't calculate that. Actually, they are then scared of intensity to some extent, I believe, and they, if you do your math in your program right now, have a look at that. How many active minutes of your weekly volume in percentage do you spend at high end? I wouldn't be surprised if it's just 5%, to be honest. And it's very common knowledge that, yeah, at least, 10, 15, 20%. That's a big mistake I did for many years now. That's why I have a very good zone one, zone two base, very strong, but my high end percentage wise, I had a look at training peaks as well, is horrendous. So if zone four, five, six, 1% spent in that zone, power wise, heart rate wise. So there is massive potential for me. And again, it comes down to the individual athlete, kind of the journey I am right now on. I did 12 years of this sport already. I have a big old in engine, with aerobic and strength wise, but my high end isn't there. And that's the reason why my thresholds, for example, in swim, bike, run are nowhere near world-class at this moment. But then we come to hypothesis number three, basically addressing what I just said, because you cannot say, okay, I'm just gonna do zone two and high end. And then suddenly in a race about four to eight hours, I expect to perform tremendously between that gap without spending time there. That doesn't work. So number three, Eight weeks of race-specific 70.3 and Ironman work is enough to bridge the gap between zone two paces and threshold range, with the ultimate goal to maintain the highest possible swim, bike, run pace effectively for 70.3 and especially Ironman. So I will be spending a lot of time in zone two right now. And I'm not talking low zone two, I'm operating around in the middle, 75, 80% of my FTP power. So it is quite solid work, that is something Again, a lot of things I'm doing here, I'm a student of the sport. I quit my career in, uh, in another world and I threw away a lot of financial things. I'm not leaving anything to chance per se, I'm not stupid. This is my career, my life, 
and nobody will care more for this even if you got write some stuff in the comments because I know it kind of invites a bit the Lionel Sanders people who get uh, a lot of comments. I am very angry with you right now. Uh, all, all kinds of things, what you should do better. That's really not what I'm looking for at all. This is for the people who are really passionate about physiology, I'm curious, like, is this actually gonna work? Because he is peeking a little bit outside the box, I'm aware of it. But again, I've been studying this sport, I've been looking at the current best, someone like uh, Richard Laidlow, Sam Laidlow, listen to all the podcasts, listen closely, and they confirmed a lot of the things, actually, that I'm having in my plan right now, so it's not all made up. Same goes for the swimming. I talked to Finland's best coaches about this, if this is complete bullshit, what I'm doing or not not bullshit and the same applies to the running as well so I'm a student of the sport I listen to all the different approaches and all of the knowledge plus the things that I actually know that worked in my own training plan for the last 12 years since I do the sport there were some phases for example one coach did this specific phase extremely good and I performed well other coaches did another phase really good so I mixed this all together the knowledge of a lot of very good coaches and systems all cooked together in one in one training plan right now with the hypotheses and everything to keep you in the loop as well. Okay, but how does it actually look? Let's have a look at my training block. So when I broke it down, I basically have three different training blocks. The number one is the main block I'll be rotating through most of the year. That is basically the high-end block and that high-end block cannot last forever because at some point there will be kind of nervous system-wise, physically-wise, kind of a little bit of stagnation, so I keep a very close eye on that. So far, for me, there was kind of three weeks where I felt I bounced back really well from that, and in the fourth week, I kind of feel a little bit of a rest, and then I'm back in it. So it will be three weeks, at this time, at some point, maybe I can do four, three weeks of this high-end work, let's say, again, not breaking 80-20 rule, followed by one week more aerobic work, an extra rest to let the system recover and absorb, with strength work and swim back run, but without going high than zone two, to keep stellar muscular stimulus and keep improving on that side. And after this one week, a little bit easier, let's say, let the system absorb, there will be a testing of swim back run to validate the last block's work. So this kind of four week cycle would be an endless rotation if there would be no racing coming up. So it will always be three weeks high end at this stage with one week, a bit easier, let's say aerobic work, strength work. But if there's a race coming up, so for example, I'll be starting that in February, 2024, I will have an eight week block and that goes a bit in the hypothesis that eight weeks are enough. The third part of the block is the eight weeks race specific training. So there the high end work will be cut out except for two to four minutes surges training in a race specific long ride. Uh, so that there's no surprises on race day, just physically. As a general rule, I don't want to be in the race and feel this has been the hardest. Obviously the whole thing together is going to be harder than the training and you can't do anything, everything in training, otherwise you're going to burn out and that's, it's absolutely stupid, obviously. But if you haven't experienced a certain amount of discomfort, physically, mentally, in a swim, for example, alone, uh, I think you're going to be able to shock and won't race to your potential. Then in this race specific block, I'll be using a 70.3 and Ironman race specific paces in swim, bike, run to bridge the gap between the zone two that I trained and the threshold with the goal to operate at a higher percentage of thresholds, which is ultimately needed if you wanna perform best in a triathlon. This was a lot of talking. I hope you guys didn't fall asleep yet, but I think the ones that are really passionate about training, passionate about physiology, they kept a close eye and you stayed till the end. So anyways, I'm gonna cut it here. At some point I might be going into all the details in my training, but on the other hand, I also wanna keep some secrets to myself. Again, right now, nobody will care what I do, what I say at all, because there's not the results to back it up. But once the results come, and they will come, it's gonna be interesting. Anyways, guys, I'm checking out. Please leave a like on the video, subscribe if you liked the video and leave a comment below what do you want to see next and I see you in next week's video.